So, okay, yeah, that looks good. So, hi, um, I'm Joshi Orndorf. I work at Parity. And today I'm going to tell you guys about Substrate. So, I'll just start with a little bit about myself. So, this is me. Um, I've gotten a haircut since this photo. <laughs> I used to be a physicist. That's what I was trained in in grad school. And then after that, I was a um, high school teacher. And the story of my high school teaching is that I started in physics and switched to computer science and got so into blockchain, specifically Bitcoin and Ethereum around 2015, um, that I was like incorporating it into my computer science classes. And I discovered that I was spending more and more of my time thinking about blockchain and in 2018 decided to come full time into the space. Uh, I'll skip a, a little bit of the boring part so that we can get on to substrate. But I now work at Parity and I've been here for about 10 months. So getting close to a year at Parity. And, um, and so like two of the big projects I've just highlighted here that I work on are the substrate recipes, which you can find at substrate.dev slash recipes. And my goal is that that'll be like the book that's the place to uh, start learning substrate. And then the second one is Substrate Seminar, which I'm actually coming from right now. So every Tuesday at 1400 UTC, which uh, I'm here on the East Coast of the United States. So for me, that's 9 a.m. Uh, we have a seminar where we get together and look at some new topic in Substrate. So that one's a little bit more low level, a little bit more technical than this intro level one. But if you like this, you might also enjoy Substrate Seminar, where we'll really dig in deep. Um, and then obviously, if you couldn't tell already, I love Substrate. I love building things with Substrate. And I love the fact that Substrate makes it easy for anyone who has an idea for a blockchain to just build it. Like I remember back in, I don't know, 2015, maybe um, thinking like, wow, Bitcoin was so cool. And then these chains came out that were like almost copies of it, you know, these altcoins as they were known at the time. Um, and then Ethereum came out and I was like, wow, you know, I feel like I could have some ideas to start a blockchain, but I just don't know how to how to do that. Like there's so much coding. And so um, that's what Substrate's about. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So as you can see here, um, my style is very much like interrupt with questions. So Dan was telling me there's a little chat box where you guys can enter questions and, and upvote them. And then I guess I can um, flip back over here and see them. Um, so yeah, so, so feel free to, to participate along with me. Um, yeah, Joshi on your slides, I think if you're trying to put them in pre presentation mode, it's not, um, showing up on your screen. I don't know if you have a dual monitor or something. Oh, wait, can you see my slides at all? Yeah. So when you were on your slides, we could see the first slide, but that's it. Can, can you see quick review of blockchains right now? No, we I don't have a second. Have you're on the Crowdcast tab still, so you'll have to click back to the... Oh, window. so it's only showing this one window. Okay, all right, I got it. So stand by yep. here. Let me... Uh... Oh, gosh. I have to somehow figure out how to present them in this same window. Uh... Nope, that's going to open a new window too. Okay. Um, I don't know. I guess we're going to go through them this way. <laughs> Yeah, maybe just drag down the um, speaker comments section just to make it bigger. Oh, sure. Yeah, those are leftover anyway. For stuff. That's, this should be fine. There. For now we see like slide that. three. Okay, yep, cool. So that's where I'm trying to be. So great. All right, thanks for the help there. For some reason, I can only show this one window. Uh, okay, so... And well, okay, so anyway, so a blockchain, every blockchain node, so like in a blockchain, there's, a, it's a decentralized network, there's all these nodes that individual people are running to support the network. And each one of these nodes needs a whole bunch of pieces. So I've listed them out here, you know, a database to store the state of the chain, whether that's like a bunch of unspent transaction outputs or the state of a virtual machine or something else that's specific to your chain. We have to have storage for that. Obviously, we need P2P networking to gossip about transactions and blocks. We need logic to author blocks and know which ones will be considered valid. We need some way of resolving forks. When there's a, a fork in the chain, we have to answer the question like, okay, which one of these alternate histories are we going to consider the real one? So we need a fork choice rule. 
and more stuff that I've written down here. And actually, maybe I'll just mention state transition functions specifically because this is one of the places that many people who develop on Substrate find it most rewarding to, to write code in what we call the runtime. So the point is, like to write a blockchain a couple years ago, you had to really either be an expert or know an expert or have an expert in like each one of these areas in order to get something that actually worked. And that meant that blockchain development would take a really long time. And so the goal of Substrate is to ease that pain and allow you to spin up your own chain, being an expert only in whatever aspect, whichever one of these aspects makes your chain unique. So like, for example, if I have some interesting runtime logic, like a new smart contracting virtual machine or a particular game that I'm trying to put on chain, I only have to write that myself. I don't also have to be an expert in P2P networking and know how to write a strong database backend and, and all of that stuff. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how this came to be. So Parity has a ton of experience building these blockchains. I think most of you probably are familiar with Parity Ethereum now becoming Open Ethereum. And that was like our first uh, first one that we were really famous for. We also written Parity Bitcoin. We also did a client called Zebra for the Zcash Association. Um, and then I think most people in this pre uh, crowdcast probably know that Parity is building the first implementation of the Polkadot network. So if you've ever written code, you'll know that by the time you've written similar code or solved similar problems three or four times, you'll start to notice that some parts look the same. You know, there were parts of Parity Ethereum that looked similar to Parity Bitcoin. For example, those are both proof of work consensus and they both use like the longest chain rule and, and things like that. Um, there are also parts that look different. Obviously, the EVM is more complex and does more things than Bitcoin's unspent transaction output logic. And so while we were in the process of developing Polkadot, we, we had this realization of, hey, there's so many similar reusable shared parts. What if we just abstract out some of these pieces into like reusable libraries? And so from Polkadot came Substrate. And basically what happened was we had this code base that we were building to make Polkadot. And we said, so many pieces of this are reusable for any kind of chain. What if we just rename this whole thing from Polkadot to Substrate? And then we extract out the few pieces that really make Polkadot unique. Like there's there's pieces that do that. You know, we have NPOS, we have um, parachains, for example. We have, like, I don't think this was true at the time, but now we have this cross-chain message passing. And those things make Polkadot unique for sure. But many, many pieces of what we at the time were thinking of as Polkadot, we realized, oh, these can be reusable. Let's make them into this framework for building blo blockchains. And so the new Polkadot repository is now built on top of Substrate. So what the heck is Substrate? Substrate's an open source, that part's pretty straightforward, modular and extensible framework for building blockchains. So modular means there's all these different pieces of substrate and you get to choose, pick and choose which ones you use and which ones you don't use. Maybe you want a proof of work chain, so you'll pick the proof of work module. Maybe you want a proof of stake chain, so you'll you know pick one of the many proof of stake modules, either the ones that handle the staking itself or the ones that handle the, the block authoring. And it's also extensible. So maybe you want to use a bunch of these modules, but not everything you need is in there great, extend it. You can write your own pieces and your own building blocks that fit in with Substrate whenever you need to. And for those of you who are Rust programmers, um, there is a nice trait-based interface for nearly every piece that you might want to plug into the, to the blockchain. Um, yeah, let's see here. Whoops. Oh, yeah, okay. So I'll go this way. So of, of all those pieces we talked about earlier, you know, there's the database, the networking, et cetera, et cetera. Substrate provides all of those things and you can take them and use them as they are. You can customize them or extend them a little bit, or you can say, no, like the, I don't know, for example, the consensus engines that come with Substrate are interesting, but they're not for me. I want to write my own consensus engine. Then great, take everything else from Substrate and write your own consensus engine. Or a, a more common way, like I mentioned, a more common way that people do it these days is that they really care about their runtime logic. 
So the runtime logic is basically what defines what kinds of transactions you can have on your chain, what the rules are for making valid transitions from block to block. Um, if you're writing a DAP, it's like your DAP specific logic. And so the, the most common way to use Substrate right now is to take all of these first several pieces and write your own runtime. So let's just take a quick look at the, like the architecture stack of Substrate, if you will. Um, so here it is. And I like this whole diagram over here, this like alien spaceship looking thing. This is my diagram of the different pieces of a substrate node. So these two that poke out the bottom, these represent ways that the node can communicate with the external world. So one is through this JSON RPC. Pretty much every blockchain has an RPC. This is what you call when you want to submit a transaction or get data about events that have happened on chain or read some of the storage from on chain. <coughs> And then we also have this one, libp2p, and libp2p is how one node in the network connects with another node in the network. So, you know, there'll be lots of these whole stacks and they'll communicate with each other over libp2p. And then inside the node, parts that don't communicate directly with the external world, but communicate through one or both of these two pink things at the bottom, we have like block storage, we have our transaction pool, we have a, I didn't write it on here, but like a fork choice rule. And then two that we'll look at close up our consensus and the runtime logic. And like I said, this is the application logic that makes this particular chain unique, makes it into this chain. And before we dig into like what consensus looks like or what runtime looks like, I've annotated the diagram over here that the bottom part of it here is written in Rust and built into native. So that's like a pretty typical pipeline for programs that you'll write in Rust. You know, you write your Rust code, you invoke Cargo or the compiler, and it gives you out some binary that runs on your hardware. So like, if I compiled it now, my Rust code would turn into an x86-64 Linux native. Or if you compiled the same code on Mac, then you'd get a Mac native binary. But with the runtime, we actually do something unique and uh, different than what most blockchains do. And you know, the runtime is still written in Rust, although there's actually some flexibility when what language you write it in. But right now they're basically all written in Rust. And then they're compiled down into Wasm and also native for an optimization that we probably won't talk today. Um, so the runtime itself is compiled down to WebAssembly or Wasm. And WebAssembly is this target that can run on nearly any platform. You know, it can run on Linux, Windows, Mac for sure. And uh, the reason that we do this is, well, there's, there's a couple reasons that we do this. One is so that you know that the runtime will always run on whatever target it is you're trying to hit. But another one is that we're gonna actually store this WASM on chain and that allows us to do this uh, feature that you might've heard of, which is forkless runtime upgrades, or you can imagine upgrading your, your blockchain without having to coordinate a hard fork in the way that you would have to with like Bitcoin or Ethereum. And I've actually got some slides about that. And so we'll, we'll take a detailed look about that in a little bit. Um, but for now, just know that the runtime itself is compiled down into, into Wasm. So, um, okay, let's jump in and look at consensus here. Uh, so I, the shapes don't really mean anything. They just help you tell what's what. So we're going to look at this little trapezoidal consensus piece up close here. Um, so consensus in many blockchains and in blockchain research for a long time was taken as this single topic of like, what chain are we on? And that's a fine way to think about it. But you can actually split that down into two different questions, both of which are unique and can be answered independently of each other. So the two questions are, first of all, who's allowed to author new blocks and when can you author them? So if you're coming from a Bitcoin or proof of work background, you're probably pretty familiar with the answer to that question, which is that anyone can author a new block as long as they've solved the proof of work, you know, as long as they've done enough hashes that they found a solution. And when can you author one? Well, you can author it as soon as you solve the proof of work. And solving the proof of work is part of authoring the block. But another whole separate question is when are blocks considered final, which is to say, you know, we're building this chain and it might have forks in it. So it's really probably more of like a, a tree, you know, you've got a Genesis block and blocks that follow and then there's there's forks. So when we're choosing like the longest chain, for example, how can we know when a block will never be reorganized or like orphaned off? And that's the question of, of finality. 
so in substrate you know you're maybe gonna get the idea already like these parts are pluggable everything's pluggable so in substrate both questions are answered separately and with both questions you can plug in different pieces of code to answer those questions so let's just like look uh at an example here <coughs> right in this in this diagram i've written uh aura which you can see from my like consensus menu if you will Aura is one of the many tools you can choose to answer that first authoring question, who may author new blocks and when. Aura is a simple one. It basically has a set of authorities and they take turns in order. So like maybe you can think of three authorities, Alice, Bob, and Joshi. And so like Alice authors the first block, then Bob does the second one and Joshi does the third one. And then we're back to Alice for the fourth one. Um, Aura is very simple and a good place to get started when what you really care about is your runtime. But there's also a lot more advanced ones. So like we have Babe, which is the same as what Polkadot uses. And this uh, Sassafras option is in development now, which I think is what Polkadot is, is going to use. We also have regular old proof of work if you want to go that route. And then we even have this thing called manual seal, which is uh, not really for production, but is really nice for when you're testing out your blockchain. And you can plug in manual seal. And what that does is it allows you to just author a block whenever you want to by issuing a, an RPC command. And you tell your block, like, okay, author, or you tell your node, author a block now. And then same thing on the finality side. Like if you followed Polkadot, you're probably um, pretty familiar with Grandpa, which is what the Polkadot relay chain itself uses for finality. So obviously any substrate chain can use that. But then we also have this like cumulus or Polkadot uh, shared finality um option which is what uh parachains that are written in substrate will use and so the way that you get the shared security from the polka dot relay chain is instead of using your own finality gadget like grandpa for example then you just follow the polka dot relay chain and we'll talk more about um cumulus in a in a second too so i guess just flipping back to this overall diagram uh, of the architecture, like we have uh, looked in detail at consensus and the punchline was there's two questions. You can answer either one of them however you want. Oh, and I guess one thing I didn't say explicitly is like if for some reason none of these many options that are available suit your needs, you can always write your own. And then when you do that, you can either keep it like proprietary or you can contribute it back to the substrate ecosystem for anyone else to use. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, right. So now let's just take a, a close up look at the runtime. And, and like I said, the runtime is where most people, especially when you're starting out with substrate, find it most rewarding to like write your own custom part of the chain. So the runtime is the block execution logic of the blockchain. That's to say it's the state transition function. And the most common way to write it and the way that you should write it when you're starting with substrate is to compose it out of pallets. So pallets are these little pieces of logic, individual pieces of logic that do individual things that you can put into your blockchain runtime. So for example, like one of the most common ones is called balances. And that basically just gives you a cryptocurrency. So if you want your chain to have a native token, great, use the balances palette. You don't have to write your own um, implementation of a token. If you want two native currencies, great, use two instances of the balances palette. Or if you want some uh, custom implementation of a token that's fancier, what balance does, write your own palette that implements balance, uh, like the currency trade or the reservable currency trade or, or something like that. And then there's, there's all these other ones that you can put in, you know, if you want to handle validator rotation, great, use this, uh, the session palette. If you wanna have um, EVM based smart contracts, like maybe you've invested some time or energy or, or money in getting uh, some contracts written that you thought you were gonna to deploy to Ethereum, but in the meantime, now you're more interested in Polkadot or maybe your own standalone chain, then the EVM module will allow you to do that. Or maybe you're interested in smart contracts, but not specifically the EVM, great. We have a new, more modern smart contracting platform uh, that comes in our smart contracts palette or contracts palette and it runs wasm based contracts or again like with everything else maybe the thing you want in your runtime isn't in here and then you can write your own palette for that so all of these can be mixed and matched and wired together in very interesting ways and um, like 
if you want to see some of that, there are good places to take a look, like the Polkadot runtime, for example, or the Substrate repository also features a, a node that uses Substrate, sort of like as an example, and it has you know made some other choices about what palettes will go into the runtime. And then finally, there's the node template, which is where if you're looking to get started on Substrate, what we recommend is cloning the node template and then using it as like a starting point. Pull out some palettes, put in different ones, swap the consensus, whatever it is that, that you're gonna do. So just taking one final look at this slide, I've added this pink text in here now, wasm stored on chain. And that's what I was hinting at earlier. Because we compile our runtime down to wasm bytecode, we can store the entire binary of the runtime on the blockchain itself, which means that any node who syncs the chain will have a complete copy of the latest runtime. And that allows us to do really, really cool things like make improvements to our runtime over time. Maybe we want to add features or like I bet a lot of people in this crowdcast have followed Kusama and you'll know that like when Kusama first launched, it was a proof of authority network and it had a pseudo key and transfers were disabled. And over time, Kusama's become more and more decentralized. Like now we have proper uh, token based proof of stake and transfers are enabled and there's no more pseudo key. And each one of those things happened through a runtime upgrade, through making changes to the runtime code, recompiling them to WASM, and then through a regular old transaction, putting that new WASM on chain. So just to drive the point home here, Substrate is built using Rust, where well, you know, it's all written in Rust, and WASM, and WASM is because we compile the runtime down to WASM. Um, okay, so let me just switch to see if there's any questions over here. Um, yeah, I guess I don't see any coming in. So Dan, you'll just have to let me know if there's a, a question that someone wants answered. Cool, I'll let you know. Cool, I'll let you know. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, cool. So, so let's take a, another look at like, or a more detailed look at how this storing the runtime logic on chain works and, and what it enables and everything. And I've kind of talked about it in the abstract so far. So let's just take like a really uh, concrete use case from blockchain history. So um, the, the thing that's over top of my slide is where we're going to start. And this is a forum post that I screenshotted from Bitcoin talk. And you can see it's from all the way back in 2010. So this is like before I was in the blockchain space and probably before most of us were, it's pretty early on. Um, but you might've read about this or you might be an OG and have been here since 2010, but the, the forum post says, seems there's a block at this particular block height. So like block 74,000 and it's exploited a bug in the network. And I think most people who are familiar with Bitcoin know that there's an all time supply cap of 21 million tokens in Bitcoin and you're never supposed to have any more tokens than that. But because Bitcoin was written in C++ and doesn't have, um, you know, you have to be really careful with a low level language like that for like checking in this case for integer overflows. What happened was there was an unchecked case and someone crafted this transaction that said, okay, you know, take an input worth 50 Bitcoins and an input worth 10 Bitcoins and the output values are these values, which, you know, I didn't add these directly, but that's way more than the 60 that the input sum to. And it's even more than the 21 millions that were supposed to be there. And so we need a fix ASAP. Pretty much everybody agreed. And the, you know, the people who could write the code started working on a fix. And, uh, oh, let's see, when I'm not in presentation mode, I can't make this disappear. So let me just do this, get it out of the way that way. Um, so what happened in the old days in, in Bitcoin was someone would write up a new Bitcoin client. And as you can see here, some nodes upgrade their software. So the old chain is chugging along somewhere around here. We have, sorry, I guess on the right side, somewhere around here, we have the, the block that does the, um, the thing that nobody wanted, but that was technically allowed in the protocol. And so when you upgrade your node, if you upgrade, then your chain reorgs and you're now using this new logic that says like overflows are no longer allowed, which is probably the logic that you wanted. 
But the problem is not everybody upgraded. Uh, you know, probably the hacker didn't upgrade because he wanted to keep his tokens, but also people that just weren't following Bitcoin talk or weren't actively participating might have forgotten to upgrade their node or not even known they were supposed to upgrade their node. And so they're left back here on on this old fork that people aren't considering like the, the real chain or the canonical chain anymore. And I think the attitude in early Bitcoin was like, OK, fine, maybe there were some bugs. Every new software has bugs. We're stamping them out, but soon it's going to be bug free. And then the chain's just going to go and go and go. And we're not going to have to do upgrades anymore. But now, 10 years later, we know that that's not really something that is very likely to happen because you know, there's always going to be more bugs. And even if there's not going to be more bugs, the use cases might change and we might want to change parameters about the chain. And so Parity solves this problem in Substrate and in every chain that uses Substrate, like Polkadot, for example, by putting the WASM directly on chain, by putting the runtime logic itself on the blockchain. And so when, when you have that WASM on chain, this is what you get, these forkless upgrades. So, you know, the old logic is chugging along here. At some point, we decide like, OK, we want to do an upgrade. And the new runtime logic is submitted as a transaction, just any old transaction, you know, just like if I wanted to send you 10 tokens, it's a transaction just like that. And then the, the new logic goes in and everyone who's running any node without even updating it, you know, you don't have to install something new your node will just start correctly running the new logic. And so you can see like there's no fork here. We don't have this, this separate block coming, coming down the bottom. Um, now, the question, like there's still this really sensitive question that that leaves about like, okay, well, you know, fine. That seems great in the case of like, there was just a simple bug in the runtime, but who gets to decide when these upgrades happen? And like, what if I don't agree with them? You know, like you might remember some other forks in blockchain history, like when some people wanted to raise the block size in Bitcoin or when people wanted to fork around the, the DAO bug in Ethereum. And sometimes these are contentious and like, it, you know, there, there would be people who would be upset if they were forced into the new logic uh, with, without what they wanted. And so that brings up the question of governance. So the runtime code is accessible through this particular transaction and it's called set code, which makes sense. You're actually setting the runtime code. And because Substrate's runtimes are so modular, like we talked about how, um, you know, you can have all these different palettes in your runtime. There isn't just one right answer or even just one answer at all about how you govern your runtime upgrades. It might be a dead simple mechanism called pseudo, which is where one particular person holds the key and that person can at any time enact a runtime upgrade. That's great when you have like your first test net and you're just trying to get things working. Obviously that's not gonna stand very well in like a public decentralized blockchain. So if you don't want that dead simple one, you can choose our democracy palette. And this is what's on Kusama and what's gonna go on Polkadot as well. And this allows like token holders to use their tokens to vote on proposals. And uh, maybe you want something kind of in between, maybe not something like so democratic where any token holder has a say, but also we don't want like a single point of failure. Great. We have a collective palette for that. And then, you know, if, if none of those are doing it for you, no problem. You're always free to still write your own palette. So maybe, maybe you want this chain that's like, you know, a pretty simple cryptocurrency. So you're going to use our balances palette and you want us to have this ability to do upgrades because, um, you know, all the reasons we talked about, you might find bugs or you might just change your plan slightly or the stakeholders might want something else out of the chain a year from now that you haven't foreseen, but you're not happy with any of our governance palettes. So fine. So you write your own and now you have exactly the chain that you want. And then finally, like everything else in Substrate, like I, you know, I think I've made a pretty good case for why you want these runtime upgrades. They're generally a good thing that makes your chain run uh, better over time and keep the community together over time. But one of the like fundamental tenets of blockchain is, hey, if you don't like it, you always have the right to fork off. You can always do it your own way. And that's still true with the runtime upgrades. So. If we, so like, let me just jump back a few slides. We talked about forkless upgrades and how this transaction comes in and the chain doesn't fork, you just switch to the new logic and that's great in almost every case. But maybe you can imagine just as a, 
like a use case here. Imagine if Ethereum had that and the transaction that went in is like a fix to the, the DAO hack, you know, like speaking at kind of an abstract level. And you're one of the people who said like, no way, code is law. Like we don't want to, you know, seems like most of the community wanted to go this way, but I didn't and I want to do it my own way. No problem. You still have the right to fork off here. So the difference is the main chain, the default thing will be to do the runtime upgrade, but you're still always allowed to go back and plan an old school for hard fork and say, hey, I see that there's going to be an on-chain upgrade and I want to explicitly not be part of it. So now you have to, you know, coordinate the hard fork the way you always did. Like anyone who doesn't want the upgrade has to uh, install the new node that's not going to do it. And now you're free to have your own fork back down here. So the, the beauty of this mechanism is that you have all this power to, uh, to like upgrade and have your blockchain adapt to what the community wants and whatever, like, you know, current events happen that weren't foreseen at the original development time. But it's never compulsory and it's never stepping on the toes of someone who says, hey, this is blockchain. I wanted to do it my own way. I want to fork off. That's always still totally allowed. So maybe I'll just slow down for a second and see if any questions have come in. Um, okay. Yeah, it looks like nothing directly addressed to me yet. So I'll just... Yeah. Got it. Oh, can you share your presentation? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll just, I guess... What was that? We can send it an email after if you want. Yeah, perfect. You can do that, and then I'll also just pop them right here so you have them for now. Yeah. Thanks. Good question. Okay. So let's continue. Um, okay, cool. So like now that I've kind of shielded you guys all on substrate, uh, for the best reasons, it's truly because I think it's like a revolutionary tool that society hasn't had for millions of years, and now we do. Um, but like, there's still this practical question, like, okay, what kind of chains can I really build with Substrate? Like, what kind of chains are people building with Substrate? And to answer that or start to answer it, let me just show you this diagram that you're, you know, likely to have seen before if you're in the Polkadot community. And that's this architecture of Polkadot diagram. So in the, in the center, you have the Polkadot relay chain. And then out here on the periphery, you have all the, the parachains with their collators as dots and um, relay chain validators also syncing individual parachains as these like white ovals. And then one of these is even a bridge chain, you know, that maybe goes and talks to Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum or whatever your favorite non Polkadot chain is. And the truth is that any one of these chains could be written with substrate. It's possible that every single one of them could be written with substrate. In practice, probably not every single one of them will be written with substrate, but as we've already discussed, the Polkadot relay chain is, and many parachains are, maybe not every one of them. Um, and so there's really no limitations about which ones can be built with substrate. It's just a matter of like choosing the right palettes, choosing the right consensus and filling in the gaps where the thing that makes your chain special hasn't been written yet. So let's just like take a look and see how much you get from substrate like let's say okay i had this idea for a chain i decided to build it on substrate how much did that save me well we have one really good case study that can help us answer that question and that's the example of polka dot so as i mentioned polka dots built on substrate there's the main substrate repo and then there's separately a polka dot repo which has the code that just makes polka dot unique and I, you know, I think the graph says it all of the nearly 300,000 lines of code that make up Polkadot, 250,000 of them were taken straight from Substrate and Substrate already provided what was needed to Polkadot in those parts. And then for the, you know, remaining last little bit, 15% or so that really does make Polkadot unique, like the parachains and the XCMP and the NPOS and Fragment and all that stuff, then that stuff gets written on top and that's what these... 42,000 lines of code are here. And these are, I just updated these stats yesterday too. Um, I, I like modified this slide from one of my colleagues. He, he used it, Sean, I don't know if you guys saw Sean give a talk at Web3 Summit back in August. Um, the numbers for straight up lines of code were smaller for both of these, but the percentage has stayed pretty much the same. I didn't even have to change these 
percentage numbers. Um, so it's, you know, as projects grow, obviously you get more lines of code, but what hasn't changed is the fact that most of what Polkadot needs is given to it from upstream by substrate. Um, okay, so that's a little dive into like the Polkadot relay chain being written on substrate. Let's just think about these like parachains a little bit. So I have this Venn diagram uh, where the two circles, the one on the left is polka dot parachains, and then the one on the right is substrate chains. And it, it's not the case that if you want to build on substrate, you have to be part of the polka dot network. It might be that you want to have a standalone chain. That's totally fine. Build it on substrate, never care about polka dot, totally welcome. That works fine. Um, or it might be that you're really into polka dot, and for whatever reason, you're not convinced that substrates for you, and that's also totally fine. You can write a parachain from scratch if you have the expertise in all of those areas and want to build those yourself. But the really interesting part is this overlap here, and you know, in reality, maybe the circles should be more like this because what we expect is that there's going to be a lot of overlap where most parachains are written with substrate and most substrate chains are at least intending or hoping to be parachains on, on Polkadot. So they're, they're in no way mutually exclusive. You can have just substrate or you can be just a parachain or you know, a really good way to get a lot of bang for your buck is, is to be both. Um, so then like there's the the practical question of like okay you know i'm convinced i already knew polka dot was cool you've convinced me substrate's cool so what do i do now like how do i actually do that you know um well parity is also developing this tool known as cumulus which is not totally done yet but it's coming along they're working on the code every day and i i do have a I, it's a little outdated now but i had a workshop at sub 0.1 a few months ago that takes you through the process of spinning up a Polkadot relay chain, using a few sample parachains written with Cumulus and connecting them on to, to Polkadot. So I think within you know a couple months, this should be pretty stable and ready for everybody to use. I don't, I, other people probably know better than I do. Um, but anyway, so what, what Polkadot, or sorry, what Cumulus gives you is this ability to take your substrate runtime and easily turn it into a parachain. So if we go back, like, um, I guess, yeah, to this, uh, yeah, to this slide. So let's say, like, okay, here I am. I'm planning to build a parachain. I know Polkadot's not live yet. Kusama is. It doesn't quite have parachains on it yet. So like, we're we're getting there. But the last thing I want to do is wait until Polkadot is like fully ready before I even start developing my my parachain. So what you can do is you can start with a standalone substrate chain right now. And you can, you know, write your runtime however you want. You can look at the consensus menu and you can say, okay, I'm definitely going to choose Polkadot eventually, but for now, let me just choose like, I don't know, Babe and Grandpa or POW and Grandpa or however you want to choose them. And then when Polkadot's at the stage or Kusama, maybe that's your target, is at the stage where you're ready to turn this thing, this chain you've built into a proper parachain, then great. You just come back to your architecture diagram, you grab out your runtime, you wrap it in Cumulus, which will be a well-documented and straightforward path, and then you submit the transaction to, to bond it to Polkadot. Now, obviously, there's all the stuff about like having enough dots, and I think there's an auction for parachain slots, so you'll you know have to have enough tokens. But from the developer standpoint, this is totally easy. Like you already wrote your runtime, and I don't have any insider knowledge or anything, but my understanding is that this is what teams like Edgeware are maybe going to do you know again not insider knowledge but like it would be totally possible they have a chain written on substrate cumulus is a step away to becoming a parachain um, we've got a couple got questions, a couple questions. Uh, oh cool okay let's see here um could you define what a parachain is oh yeah absolutely i'd, I'd be happy to so parachain is not really a substrate concept. It's it's more of a polka dot concept, but I'm I'm happy to help you understand it. So let me come back to like this diagram. And I didn't make this. This is totally cribbed from just polka dot literature. Basically, the idea of a parachain is that it's a blockchain. It has its own runtime. Maybe it does smart contracts or maybe it's just a simple cryptocurrency or Maybe it's a voting system or maybe it's a land registry or like, you know, insert your favorite blockchain application here. Maybe there's a parachain that does that. 
But instead of being this standalone chain like the blockchains we've seen so far, you know, like Bitcoin is great, but it only works with Bitcoin. Like it doesn't interact easily with Ethereum, for example. When you have a parachain, so um, in the diagram, these little like pink squares around the periphery, these are parachains. They're all their own blockchains. They have their own nodes known as collators, but they also have these nodes known as validators. And the validators are also part of the Polkadot relay chain. And so when you're, when I say like this blockchain is a parachain, what that means is it has its own runtime. It does its own specific application, uh, application specific thing, but it's also part of the Polkadot network. And that means it has shared security that comes with the whole Polkadot network. So if someone wanted to nefariously try to like revert a block from one of these parachains, they would have to overtake the security of the entire Polkadot network and all these other parachains that are part of it and the, the relay chain itself. So parachains are the, the chains that Polkadot brings together. And then also as a parachain, you have this ability to do what we call cross-chain message passing, which is like, I don't know, maybe imagine this parachain is like, a, oh, can you guys see my mouse pointer? Maybe not, but imagine this top parachain is like some kind of land registry and then the next one beside it is some kind of cryptocurrency. And those are both like pretty, you know, application specific things. And now imagine that I want to sell you some land in exchange for this cryptocurrency. Well, with cross-chain message passing, we can coordinate that so that the land registry updates the, the deed to be in your name. And, you know, simultaneously, I get the cryptocurrency payment over on, on this parachain. So by becoming a parachain, you're no longer like siloed into your own little universe that doesn't interact with other chains. So that was a very good question. Um, next one, can you elaborate a bit about authoring and finality? Isn't finality the eventuality once the block is authored? What's the additional verification happening after a block is authored and before it's added to the chain? Okay, yeah, so so this is a good question. So in in the old school proof of work chains like Bitcoin, for example, we have what's known as like probabilistic finality, which is to say in Bitcoin or even in Ethereum 1.0 or Litecoin or, you know, like choose your favorite proof of work chain. You can never say to yourself this particular block that I care about, maybe because I like received a payment in there will always forevermore be part of the chain. You don't have those guarantees. Because what can always happen is that another fork will emerge that will be longer or uh, more desirable according to whatever the fork choice rule is. But like in, in a lot of blockchains, the fork choice rule is just longest chain wins. Um, and so you don't have that finality. All you can say in a network like Bitcoin is, I am blank percent sure that this block will never be orphaned off. And for practical purposes, that usually becomes good enough after, you know, four or five, six, ten blocks. Um, but sometimes you really want to be sure you really want to be able to say this block is in the chain. And even if a longer chain comes along, I know that my block will still be in it. So then your question is like, what's the additional verification happening? So so here's how it works. Let me just take an example, because I, I think speaking in the generality will be a little too abstract. So I just gave this example of like, let's say we're using Aura for our block authoring and Grandpa for our finality. So Aura is totally straightforward and does what I said, like Alice authors a block, then Bob authors one, then I do, now Alice, now Bob. And we just keep going and going and going in that order forever. And, you know, maybe at some point later on down the road after you've like received a payment and thought for sure that it was valid and you know i don't know allocated those funds elsewhere maybe alice and bob decide to gang up on you and start authoring blocks on a different fork that eventually becomes a longer chain well if we only had this probabilistic finality like we have in in bitcoin then you're kind of hosed you know these two block authors were able to gang up on you and orphan off your block well, here's what grandpa does. Here's the, the piece that grandpa or other finality gadgets like it add to the game. And oh, and just to give you another example, like I think in the Ethereum 2.0 spec, they're talking about like Casper, the friend, uh, friendly finality gadget. So I don't know the internal workings of that one as well, but it does the same job that grandpa does. It answers this when are blocks considered final question. So with finality, once a block is authored, that's great. The nodes gossip it and they sync it into their chain and, you know, they start to try to build new blocks on top of it. 
But there's also this these two rounds of voting that are known as grandpa voting. And the authorities and grandpa, whoever they are, they'll cast votes that say, like, I've seen this block. And then when they see another enough other uh, validators saying they've seen the block, then you can cast the second rounds of vote which votes, which says, I vote for finality of this block. And once there's two thirds of the grandpa voters who have cast their second vote for that block, then it becomes final. And so what that means is, even if the people who are authoring the blocks as part of Aura construct a longer, like malicious attack fork, we won't reorg to that fork because we already have our two thirds grandpa votes. And so it allows you to answer this question of which blocks are final in a much more satisfactory way, where instead of saying like, I'm 98% sure this one's final and 95% sure this one's final and 90, you know, and it gets lower and lower. You can say, I'm sure with certainty that this block that I care about will never be orphaned off. Um, and then like everything with substrate, it's optional. Maybe you like that sort of like um, probabilistic finality that comes with Bitcoin. And if that's the case, then in your chain, uh, you can answer this question by saying, there is no finality. It only comes down to the authoring engine. And then you just, you know, like, uh, don't choose anything there, for example. And that's also a perfectly valid thing that you can do. So let's see. I think we had some more questions. Thanks, Joshi, with a Y, for the presentation. Uh, can you tell us about the efficiency of typical runtime, what the device requirements would be? Oh, yeah, totally. So, like, uh, I guess maybe you're thinking about... Um, when you know there's all these blockchains out there and some of them will have these claims of being like super lightweight and fast run it on a phone run it on a raspberry pi and then other ones are like you know you need a vps with 16 gigabytes of memory and you know 25 cores and unicorn blood and like whatever else you know it has to be some kind of big beefy machine and the the answer to answer that question you have to be talking about a specific chain so you get to tune those things to your desire when you're working with substrate. And typically the knobs that you turn when you're, when you're tuning the question of like, can it run on a pie or does it need this big beefy machine? Those are consensus related knobs. So if you, for example, if you want to have like a really fast block time and really lightweight system that like reaches finality quickly and can run on any device, then that just sort of constrains your consensus choices a little bit. And like, you know, you'll have to have a set of authorities, specific set of authorities, for example. Or if you want something like super duper decentralized with totally permissionless mining and everything, you can do that too. But then you're moving in that trade-off space, possibly toward like needing uh, machines with really high bandwidth to support all the gossip. So that's sort of like a, a non-answer. But the important part is that Substrate doesn't answer that question for you. You get to answer that question. And then depending on what you're trying to do with your chain, then you build your substrate chain accordingly. Uh, let's see. You mentioned that you can have a standalone substrate chain. Is Edware such a standalone chain? Because I was asking myself how Edgeware can already run as pair chain if Polkadot the relay. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So like I want to just say again, I don't really know that much about Edgeware, but I at least do know enough to answer this question. And right now it is a standalone chain. It has its own consensus. I don't remember exactly what consensus it's using, but then if it's intention, it sounds like you're sort of confirming that I was right, that like Edgeware does intend to become a parachain eventually. So then what they would do is they would update their node once, you know, Polkadot's live and they're ready to become a parachain and they would just take out, they would say like, okay, we're done with whatever finality gadget we're using, probably grandpa and switch it to Cumulus. And then, you know, after the, the bonding transaction goes through on the relay chain, now all of a sudden this thing that used to be a standalone chain is now a pair chain. And then like, just to say a little bit more about that, it can happen the other way too. And I, I don't think this is Edgeware's intention, but just like as a generic example, you can imagine a chain that starts out as a parachain, you know, maybe it doesn't get built until after Polkadot's live and it starts as a parachain. And then it sort of like becomes its own thing. And either because it gets too big or too small or because of political differences or whatever, it decides it doesn't want to be part of Polkadot anymore. You can do the same thing in advance where you can say like, okay, well, let's just do one of these upgrades and strip out Cumulus and instead put like Grandpa back in there or Casper FFG or whatever you want. Um, so yeah, so that works both ways. 
how will DAOs be built on top of Polkadot? Will they be parachains or will they be built on top of parachains? Can DAOs be interoperable? Yeah, so Substrate doesn't impose any specific answer to that question. Uh, so let's just like think through a couple of possibilities. Whoops. Um, I guess maybe I'll look at this one. So like, okay, here's our Substrate architecture diagram and then we're gonna zoom in on the runtime again. And so we talked about how each one of these pallets can be added or, or removed or whatever. And in some sense, each one of these runtimes is itself a DAO, you know, like you can have your own democracy set up however you want. You could put a collective in there if you want to. And so you could have a DAO that is a standalone substrate chain. You could also take that substrate chain and make it a parachain. So then you can think of a parachain that is a DAO. Or you can also think of a parachain where like, it isn't trying to be an individual DAO, but rather it's trying to be a home where people can deploy their own DAOs, like almost as smart contracts. So, oh yeah, so you could definitely do that. You could definitely use the contracts palette and then, you know, the contracts people deploy could be DAOs. But you could also write this, this palette yourself that like is somewhere in between where it allows multiple DAOs to be deployed, but not arbitrary smart contracts. And then, um, yeah, and you can do that with your runtime. So then the, the second part of the question about how will DAOs interoperate, you know, there's the possibilities are, are limitless. You could have a substrate chain that has a smart contracting EVM and then they operate, interoperate, you know, however you express in your smart contracts, just like on Ethereum. Or you could have like two, a, a substrate chain that is a parachain that is a DAO and another parachain that's another DAO. And they can interoperate with the cross-chain message passing, you know, sort of the the way we described for um, like just arbitrary parachain interaction. So that's that's a good question, and like I maybe just one last thing on that. Um, the parody comms team was talking to me the other day about doing a promotional video, like, hey, choose some application and make a video how to write blank in thirty five minutes on Substrate. And uh, I, I ended up choosing TCRs. So soon I'll have this video called Write a TCR in 35 Minutes with Substrate. Um, but another possibility that I had considered before I chose TCR was, was a DAO. So, you know, that's a, a thing that's like super possible to write on top of Substrate. And then either, as we discussed, let it be standalone, let it be a parachain on Kusama or on Polkadot or however you like. And then let's say, let's see, is there going to be a built-in stack for atomic swaps or pairings with other cryptos, say Kusama to DOT, Kusama to ETH? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's not one that I have any insight into as far as like what people are planning or building, but uh, I can answer from a technical perspective, like, is that possible? Totally possible. You would just need to do like if you're talking about uh, interoperating with an existing chain, let's see, where is that? Oh yeah, then you'd have to do one of these things where you have like a, a bridge chain that interoperates with, you know, if you want to trade against e your token versus ETH, for example, then you need a bridge chain to ETH and there's lots of research out there about that. But if you're talking about, you know, like two parachains on Kusama, that's totally possible. Or I saw this proof of concept the other day at Substrate Seminar where it was like a single substrate chain. It wasn't, uh, this isn't even the right diagram because it was a standalone chain, but it had multiple tokens on the, the chain itself. And then like the, the proof of concept that they were showing off was a decentralized exchange that works like, um, oh, I, I can't remember. Oh, Uniswap, I think Uniswap is the name. They basically just stole the logic from Uniswap and implemented it on a substrate chain. So, you know, like I said, I don't know what anyone has plans in terms of swapping Kusama for DOT or ETH or whatever. You'll have to follow Twitter for that. But is it technically possible? Totally. And then let's see one more here. I've heard that parachains can become a secondary relay chain. How does it work and why would parachains want to become secondary relay chains? Yeah, that's a that's a super cool thing to explore, too. <coughs> So, you know, we have this diagram of like relay chain in the middle, that's the backbone, then all these parachains out here that do their own thing and whatever their own thing is, that's up to whatever you build on substrate. Um, but, you know, then I also told you like the Polkadot relay chain itself is built on substrate. So basically the way that this would work is, uh, you know, you would just take this entire diagram and, uh, 
like shrink it down here. And then in place of one of these parachains, you just put this entire diagram where it goes. And then like, you know, we're almost out of time here. So maybe I'll just get kind of inception-y at the, the last second. Like you're not limited to doing this just once either. Like you can make this recursive tree structure as deep as you want. And like, eventually it gets kind of hard to even see what's going on. But the, the beauty of it is no individual blockchain needs to be overseeing all of this stuff happening. Uh, the main, you know, like main relay chain and as much as there is one only needs to know about its parachains, that's it. And then this one only needs to know about its parachains. Um, and like, well, I've never made this before, but it's kind of reminding me of this picture of like the uh, Mandelbrot set. We should um, <laughs> we should start to promote that. Like recursive relay chains are as cool as the Mandelbrot set. <laughs> so, okay. So the next part of your question was like, why would you want to do that? And you know, one answer is just because it's cool and technically possible. Another answer is because um, just for like economic reasons, there's only so many slots for parachains on the main relay chain. And so if we want more and more interoperability, this would be one way to achieve it. Is it possible to program off-chain P2P interactive protocol with substrate, something like Mimblewimble? Is it possible? Yes, it's totally possible. Is it something that's in our menu of things you can easily slide in? No. So like when we're looking at this diagram, um, you know, we don't have like one of these that you can just slide in there, but you can totally, totally build that up. And that seems like the kind of thing that would be like really valued and appreciated in the substrate ecosystem. So, um, okay, that's pretty much uh, out of time and we happen to run out of questions at the same time. Uh, oh, let's see one more. Are the transactions from parachains clubbed into the main Polkadot relay chain blocks, assuming that these parachain blocks are leveraging the main Polkadot for security? Yeah, so uh, the design here is really interesting. And my colleague, uh, Joe Petrowski, has given some really good talks and written some blog posts about it. The simple answer is that the parachain transactions themselves are not like in clear text in the relay chain blocks, because that would make the relay chain blocks way too huge. Instead, what happens is that there's this witness data that witnesses to a valid parachain block. And then that witness data is included like by hash into the Polkadot um, relay chain blocks. So I guess like to summarize that, there's a digest of all the transactions that happen in a relay chain and it gets included in the Polkadot uh, relay chain blocks. So there isn't the entirety of the transaction, but there is the cryptographic ability to go back and say like, okay, this parachain block was attested to by Polkadot right here at this specific spot. So that's how we get the shared security. Like your, I mean, your, your idea is basically right. There's just a cryptographic optimization to prevent the relay chain blocks from getting too ginormous. Um, okay, so I'm going to just end then. I, uh, I, was, I had some demos uh, prepared, but we totally ran out of time, which is great. I don't know. I'd be happy to come back and do another more hands-on one in the future. But let me just uh, show you guys this last slide. So if you want to learn more about Substrate, like an hour is kind of hard to get everything down. Our main website is substrate.dev. And then um, these two subpoints are things that I personally am responsible for. So Substrate Seminar is a lot like this that we did today, but it's usually a little more technical and uh, everybody has a mic, so conversation is welcome. And then uh, the Substrate Recipes is, is a great place to like learn how to build these pallets, learn how to compose the pallets into a runtime and basically learn how to build all your chains on Substrate. And then the, the final thing, this QR code takes you to the Substrate Technical Riot Chat, which is um, a really, really cool and useful place that you can ask questions when you're learning to develop with Substrate. And I always like to uh, give this analogy, like um, all of the core Substrate devs are in there. And so when you're stuck, you can ask the person who wrote that code. And in some cases, that's even like Gav himself. And that's pretty unique. I don't think, uh, you know, you don't get that experience. Like if you have trouble with Windows, you can't go to a chat room and talk to Bill Gates, but with Substrate, you, you still can. Um, so yeah, so thanks everybody for, uh, for coming and listening today. I love talking about Substrate and you gave me a chance to do it. And then I, I hope to see you guys around the community more. I'm on Riot regularly and you're all welcome at seminar too. 
And thanks, Dan, for hosting, too. I appreciate it. Well, thanks, Joshy. We will follow up with an email with some of the links that Joshy mentioned today, so everyone can look out for that and hopefully get a second session scheduled. Yeah, sounds good. All right, see you guys next time. Cool. Thank you.